Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this awards program to honor extraordinary leadership in advancing women in peace and security. I want to give a very special welcome to our remarkable honorees and to their relatives and friends who have traveled here to be with them. I also want to welcome the members of our diplomatic corps, ambassadors of Finland, Kosovo, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Albania, as well as officials with the Canadian and British embassies. Georgetown has always recognized our obligation to engage with the pressing challenges of our time and to seek ways to contribute to the flourishing of our global community. As our president, Jack DeJoya, has observed, there are many approaches to the complex work of building sustainable peace or realizing the full development of our diverse societies. Yet one theme emerges, the importance that women are full participants and valued leaders in global affairs. And that is the focus of our coming together this morning. In December of 2011, then Secretary of State <clears throat> Hillary Clinton came to Georgetown to launch the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. On that occasion, the president of the university also announced the creation of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. It would pioneer innovative research and scholarship that is evidence-based, work to bridge theory and practice, and bring together global leaders to advance women's participation in peace and security. As the secretary said at that time, whether it's ending conflict managing a transition or building a country, the world cannot afford to continue to ignore half the population. This is not a women's issue. It cuts to the heart of our national security and the security of people everywhere. The Institute recently released a new global index on women, peace, and security that was undertaken with our Norwegian partners. The index for the first time ranks 153 countries on the status of women's inclusion, justice, and security. We are thrilled that Secretary Clinton is back with us today. Over 20 years ago, as First Lady, she made an historic speech on behalf of the United States at the UN Conference on Women that took place in Beijing. She said then that it is no longer acceptable to discuss women's rights as separate from human rights, and went on to pronounce words that would echo around the world. Human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. It marked a key moment in the empowerment of women as women's rights were chiseled into international law and it sparked a worldwide movement that continues to this day. Those years found her traveling to over 75 countries on behalf of progress for women and girls, speaking out, for example, against the treatment of Afghan women, leading efforts to combat human trafficking, helping to support women in Northern Ireland who were involved in the peace process. And as she continued to champion these issues, as the first elected woman senator from New York, and then as Secretary of State, she reminded us that women's issues are critical to national security and elevated them as a central component of US foreign policy. And as you all know, in 2016, she became the first woman to run for president of the United States as the nominee of a major political party and won the popular vote. So please welcome. Please, please welcome the honorary founding chair 
of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Hello, Georgetown. It is great to be back here, and I am delighted to join you for this award ceremony uh, once again. I want to thank Milan, who has been my partner, my colleague, and my friend for decades now. Uh, there's an old expression you've probably heard, uh, if you want something done, ask a busy woman. Well, I have to say, that is uh, Ambassador Milan Verveer, uh, summed up very well. The Institute for Women, Peace, and Security is a testament to her vision as well as her sheer determination to make that vision a reality. I also want to thank uh, President DeJoya. Uh, he truly embodies the Georgetown motto of men and women for others, and his leadership about uh, so many important matters, but particularly this institute is absolutely extraordinary. You know, this university and this institute have flourished uh, because so many people have seen its merit and have understood that it was filling uh, a gap that many didn't even know existed. So I always am delighted to return to the hilltop and to sing the praises along with all of you of heroic women and men who have been recognized over the years for their commitment to advancing women in peace and security. So be prepared to be humbled, inspired, and energized. Uh, they are particularly relevant this year when the steady drumbeat of women speaking out about their own experiences has never been stronger. I think this is a watershed moment and a powerful reminder of how important it is to make sure that women have a place at any table where decisions are made, from the C-suite to media to government to the peace table everywhere. We can all do a better job of making this a priority every day. And as Americans, standing up for human rights and against injustice around the world is vital. I would argue it is part of the American DNA. It is also, however, important to be clear-eyed about the challenges we face in our own country. That's true whether we are grappling with endemic harassment and assault, threats to women's health and reproductive rights, or pay disparities and other persistent inequities in our own economy. But no one should ever underestimate the power of women and girls not only to improve their own lives, but to help lift up families, communities, and entire nations. The extraordinary courage and resilience of women and girls in the face of vast inequity and injustice is humbling. I've listened to girls as young as 12 argue forcefully and passionately against child marriage. I've met activists who risk their own safety to speak out against honor killings. I've held the hands of women and tiny little girls who lived through unimaginable horrors and emerged determined not to be destroyed by what was done to them, but to do everything they could to prevent others from facing and enduring what they had. Through it all, I have seen that women are not only victims of war and conflict, but they are agents of change, makers of peace, and drivers of progress. That was truly the belief behind the creation of the Georgetown Institute for Women in Peace and Security, the first of its kind in the world back in 2011. We came together to declare that the issue of women's full participation in peace and security could no longer be relegated to the margins of international affairs. And in the years that followed, 
the Institute has gathered the data to support what we knew in our hearts, that encouraging women's participation is strategic and necessary to peace, prosperity, and security. The tradition of women standing up for human rights and democracy stretches across centuries and continents. From the British suffragists who fought for and won the right to vote 100 years ago tomorrow, before we did, to the women around the world who are at the forefront of taking on urgent global threats like climate change and violent extremism to today's honorees. There's Nadia Murad, a former captive of the Islamic State, a Yazidi human rights activist who is working to bring ISIS to justice while helping survivors of genocide and human trafficking heal and rebuild their lives and their communities. Nadia's work is close to my heart because for decades, we have tried to take on the global scourge of human trafficking. I started working on it as First Lady, as a Senator, as Secretary of State. In fact, it was 20 years ago this March that with the help of your professor, Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, we worked with the Clinton administration to help change the way that America saw this issue, to recognize human trafficking for what it is, not a cultural artifact, not collateral, but a crime that deserves to be prosecuted. When we first took on this issue, we addressed what we called the three Ps of prevention, prosecution, and protection. During my time as Secretary of State, we added a fourth, partnership. We brought together NGOs, governments, and the private sector to fight together against human trafficking and forced labor. And because we know that this is not an issue that affects only the far-flung corners of the world, we made sure that for the first time, the 2010 Trafficking in Persons report included data on human trafficking here in the United States. This is not just someone else's problem. This is all of our problem. Our second honoree, Weiwei Nu, is a human rights and democracy activist from Myanmar. She spent years as a political prisoner under the Burmese military government. One of the horrors of her imprisonment was being cut off from everything that was going on in her society. So out of that experience, she has worked to raise awareness and mutual understanding and improve the human rights of the Rohingya. As Secretary of State, when I introduced Resolution 1888 to the Security Council of the United Nations, it was just months after visiting with survivors of mass rape and brutality in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We wanted to bring together the international community to expand our commitment to combating sexual violence in conflict zones, and we created the first U.S. National Action Plan on women, peace, and security to do just that. It was very gratifying to see the Congress pass a law to codify that national plan just last year, and I look forward to seeing our government implement it. In recent years, the evidence has only grown to support the fact that sexual violence in conflict is both a gross human rights violation and a security challenge. It fuels displacement, weakens governance, destabilizes societies. It inhibits post-conflict resolution and imperils the long-term stability of countries. Clearly, we still have urgent work to do. Just last fall, the current UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict traveled to Bangladesh, where hundreds of thousands have fled to escape the crisis in Myanmar. She reported that every single woman she met had either witnessed or endured brutal sexual assault. The stories of the atrocities being committed against Rohingya women and girls, some very young girls, should horrify each and every one of us, and more than that, should spear all of us to action. This is not a partisan issue in this time of such great partisanship. In fact, it's not even 
a woman's issue. It should be an issue that goes to the very heart of who we are as human beings, to our common humanity. Our third honoree, Lise Doucette, is a reporter who has worked to shine a light on the experiences of women and children in conflict, telling the stories that are too often overlooked. She has reported from some of the most important and dangerous areas in the world and done so with courage, compassion, and clarity. Good reporting is not only compelling and enlightening, it is absolutely essential. I still believe in truth, evidence, facts. There is no such thing as alternative reality. And we have to make sure that we don't try to live in it or let anybody else push us to live in it either. So at a time when expertise, truth, and facts are under siege, the work of journalists like Lee's is particularly crucial. Now, it's easy to be overwhelmed by all that's going on at the world and on the world stage and here at home. I know that. I get overwhelmed at least a dozen times a day. <laughs> I've spent uh, the last year traveling the country, meeting people at signings for my book and other events, listening to what's on their minds. And I've been asked more times than I can count, what can we do? Now, one answer is clear. Advancing the rights, opportunities, and full participation of women and girls is the great unfinished business of the 21st century. I intend to keep fighting uh, to pursue this agenda and to remain on the front lines of democracy. But the most important question for everyone here is, what can you do? What will you decide to make your mission, your purpose, your passion, to use your education, your mind, your resolve to make our world a better place? And in particular, what can you do to make sure that the lives of women and girls is never again relegated to the backstage somewhere, seen as frivolous or a luxury that we can't afford because of all the other important matters that are facing us. I think the stories of today's honorees are proof of what's possible when we refuse to give in or let our voices be silenced. It is hard to continue to speak up, speak out, stand up against what you think of as obvious wrongs. But do not grow weary. Bring a sustained commitment. Think of these honorees. Don't get discouraged. Draw hope and inspiration from each of them. And leave here today with a renewed commitment to making your own mark on the world. I know that's what we need more than ever, and I'm very confident that this university, the students, and all of you here today can really make a difference. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Secretary Clinton, for your inspiring words uh, and for your ongoing commitment on these issues. Uh, it is now time uh, for our honorees. Imagine you're 19 years old, as probably some of you are. You're going to school. You have aspirations for your future. However, one day terrorists come and subject you, your family, and your community 
to unspeakable horrors. That's what happened to Nadia Murad when the Islamic State invaded her village in northern Iraq and rounded up fellow Yazidis, a Kurdish religious minority whom ISIS viewed as infidels. ISIS killed many members of Nadia's family and then abducted her. Thousands of Yazidi men, women, and children were massacred or kidnapped by ISIS. And hundreds of thousands have been displaced by the violence against their religious community. Yazidi women have faced additional abuse, the abuse of sexual torture at the hands of their captors. Many were sold into sexual slavery at slave markets. Nadia is a survivor. She was one of the fortunate who managed to escape her brutal captivity, and she has since devoted her life to being a voice for those left behind. She said, it never gets any easier to tell her story. Each time, she said, she relives it. But she added that it is the best weapon she has against terrorism and she plans on using her voice until the terrorists are put on trial. She has recently written a book about her experience entitled, The Last Girl, My Story of Captivity and My Fight Against the Islamic State, and I hope you'll all buy it. She has joined forces with Amal Clooney to insist that the international community bring the perpetrators of these crimes against humanity to justice. She has also founded an organization, Nadia's Initiative, to help women and marginalized groups to have a role in stabilizing and rebuilding their communities. In 2016, the United Nations named her the first Goodwill Ambassador for the dignity of survivors of human trafficking. She has experienced in her life unimaginable brutality. Yet despite that pain and suffering, she is determined to ensure justice for the Yazidi people, and she truly wants to be the last girl in the world with a story like hers. As has been said of her, Nadia's resilience and dignity are the most powerful rejection of what ISIS stands for. Now for the citation. For her tireless efforts to support and advocate for the Yazidi people, urging that ISIS terrorists who perpetrated the atrocities committed against them are brought to justice. For helping survivors by bringing their voices to the world and working to break the stigma of sexual violence and human trafficking that continues their nightmare. And for her determination to make it possible that other girls never have to endure the experiences she faced, Georgetown is proud to present the 2018 Hillary Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security to Nadia Murad. Weiwei Nu was an 18-year-old law student when her family was sentenced to 17 years in Myanmar's infamous prison by the governing military junta as punishment for her father's opposition to the brutal regime. During her seven years in prison, 
She learned from other women prisoners about the injustices and discrimination faced by women across Myanmar. She called her incarceration a university of life. A presidential amnesty in 2012 made possible her release from prison. She was then 25 years old. It was an historic time. Myanmar was embarking on a democratic transition. And at the same time, the country was still mired in struggle with the armed ethnic, in the armed ethnic conflicts. Weiwei embraced democratic reforms. She wanted to be an agent for positive change, determined to address the violence, intolerance, and inequality afflicting her country. She founded two organizations, the Women's Peace Network, Arakan, and Justice for Women. Through the Women's Peace Network, she has focused on peacemaking and efforts to build bridges across ethnic and religious divisions, particularly among young people. And as a Rohingya, she understands the horrors of hatred and intolerance. Through her organization, Justice for Women, she is working to educate women on their rights and efforts to combat sexual harassment and domestic violence. Weiwei's work in Myanmar is critical. As the formal peace process between the government and various armed ethnic groups stalls, as the persecution of the Rohingya minority goes on in all of its horrific forms and displaces tens of thousands of Rohingyas. Weiwei works through civic education, social media campaigns, and training programs to promote understanding, justice, and the possibility of a brighter future for her country. Now the citation. For her unstinting efforts to build a more peaceful and equitable future for Myanmar, for using her voice to end ethnic violence, particularly against the Rohingyas, and for advancing progress for women, Georgetown is proud to present the 2018 Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security to Weiwei Nu of Myanmar. If you follow the news on BBC, Lise Doucette is a familiar voice and face. She has been deployed over many years to cover some of the most important events of our time, from the uprisings of the Arab Spring to all the major wars in the Middle East, from conflicts in Africa to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Lise has been there. And she was in Syria during the early hopeful days of the pro-democracy protests. And she's been there ever since, returning time and again to cover the unfolding catastrophe. When I reached out to her about this award, I found her in Aleppo on her way to Homs. Through her reporting, we have witnessed the worst humanitarian crisis there since World War II. Lise takes us beyond the front lines to see the toll on civilians, the intensity of desperation, the refugee crisis, the plight of women and children. Such is the suffering in Syria that she has made a documentary on the children there to see through her eyes what is happening to them through their descriptions and their experiences. 
She has described her reporting approach in this way. I want you to come out of your living rooms and let me take you with me. And it has been a hallmark of her reporting to tell the stories of marginalized and silenced communities to show the human face of conflict. Among her stories are the stories of women, which are often ignored in the geopolitical narratives of conflict and security. Brave women like Nadia, here with us today. The everyday lives of women in Afghanistan, or the remarkable women fighting for democracy whom she is highlighting in a new radio series called Her Story Made History. She never forgets their role in war and peace. When asked if her reporting made her more or less political, she said, I have no hesitation taking the sides of the people or the children because they are caught in the middle. My politics is humanitarian politics. And now for the citation. For her courageous international reporting, that has been characterized by authority, compassion, persistence, and humanity, for telling the stories of the people behind the headlines, particularly the women and children, to ensure that their experiences are reported and their voices are heard. The better we understand the consequences of war, the harder we work to achieve peace. Today, Georgetown is proud to present the 2018 Global Trailblazer Award to Lee Doucette of the BBC. And now we'll have an opportunity to hear from the honorees and Secretary Clinton uh, as they are engaged in conversation with a very experienced interviewer, Lise Doucette. When the discussion concludes, we ask that you remain in your seats until our guests have left the room. But Lise, before we turn it over to your questions and those that the students have put forward, I'd like to ask you a question. Whether it's been in Afghanistan or in Syria or so many other places, you have highlighted the stories of women. Why do you believe in war coverage it is important to amplify their voices? Thank you for that question, Milan. Thank you, all of you here today, to listen to our questions and answers. I would, I would simply say that's not up to me. I'm just the storyteller. And wherever I've gone, whether it's in the darkest and most forbidding of places, women always want to tell their own stories. Sometimes they need journalists like me to amplify their voice. But there's no doubt in my mind that they have their voice. Let me give you just one short story from Afghanistan and one from Syria, the lessons I have learned. And I know, Melan and Secretary Clinton, you spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I was in a remote corner of northern Afghanistan in a small Turkmen, a tribal community, where, sadly, men control all access to the women. And my, me and my colleague, a female producer, had to negotiate long and hard to get access to the women. It took hours. And then when we were finally let in, because we were women, I found out why the men didn't want to give us access to the women. Because the, all the women did was criticize the men. They criticized how the men didn't work, that the women had to work long into the night. They criticized that the, the money and the family went to things and other than they should. And I realized then that story stuck with me. And I thought, even where we think the women don't want to speak, they do. We just have to open the door and sometimes just the window. 
And in Syria, I learned another lesson in the last seven years. And this is a lesson about even the youngest of voices. Secretary Clinton mentioned the 12-year-old child bride who knew exactly what was happening to her and what should happen to her in another kind of society. And as year in, year out went by in covering the Syrian war, after every visit to Syria, I would reflect and think, what is the story that stayed with me the most? Who showed the most courage? And almost without exception, it was a child, a boy or a girl. And what I learned was that children, the youngest voices, are not just decorations in our pieces, the tears, the smiles, the cute faces. Not only do they have a story to tell, they have been through some of the worst of our times, times where women and children are not just on the front line, they are the front line. And in a time such as ours, where we all talk about rights, one right is sacred, our right to tell our own story. And that's it from me. Now, let's, uh, let's first of all, it's fanta fantastic to be here with you, to see you again, Nadia, to meet you, Weiwei, and to see you again, Secretary Clinton, and looking so well. Let me begin, Nadia, by, by asking you, I think the question that will be on everyone's mind here today, how are you? Keep Halik, no? You've been through so much, including writing a book and being in a film. أثناء قلك يا باشم نهات يا أو تشتيها كم بيجن بيا خلاص كرنوم معاناته وداعشوا عدالتهم بقهش نهي أو تشتاق بويا ونبويا نقهش تتمام بويا كم بيجن مت باشن بس با حتى ما وقوتها يم بين ببيفنوم كاربن بتدي داعشوا إرهاب سكنن سبشوا مت باشن to be honest, I'm uh, not so good because the things that we hope for and think that we work for still are not accomplished yet. We still are not there yet. But I should say that I'm doing well because I'm hopeful that we still have energy to fight and uh, to bring ISIS to justice and achieve what we're looking for to achieve for the people. So many times you've gone to the top world bodies and asked for help. And I think we're frustrated that it didn't come as quickly and in the way you thought. We last met in September when you and Amal Clooney scored a victory. You got the Security Council to sponsor a resolution authorizing, at last, an investigation into war crimes. What has happened in the past five months? Are they moving ahead with that promise? Are they keeping it? وكم من بيت بيجي مزجلة كم ممنون مش أمل كلوني كأف تقريبا ما بعد السال مساعدة مو ضحية دي هم ما كريا ك كعربة أمنية ما بجي بينا نودع عشم بينا محكمة بشتوي تشتي حتى إنها بشتوي دن داني تشتجنا بويا كده عشق بيا محكمة برسا ما جي كري جهد فريق نهاية أو تيمي هكا ويتشال ويدري هي نهاية شكرين بس حكومة عراق إنها دس بيكريا كمقابرة فكل شنقالي وجهدي در وهناك محكمة العراق إذا بداعش ناتك بس وقت تحقيق كنا محكمة إنه حكم بقنيا. First of all, I want to thank Amal Kaloni for her relentless effort, her continuous support for myself and other Yazidi victims trying to bring ISIS to justice every day, and she is still trying that uh, with all her ability. Uh, second is uh, ever since we have started, and uh, even after September 22nd and until now, we're working towards that goal to be achieved. Uh, the last updates are uh, there is a team that is dedicated, dedicated to and do the investigation in Iraq and to bring ISIS to justice, and the Iraqi government is uh, right now taking some charge on that and uh, started um, doing the forensic investigation and all that in mass graves in Iraq, uh, especially for the Yazidi community. There hasn't been any trial yet. There's some tribunal trial within the, uh, the Iraqi court. There's still some investigation. So nobody has been sentenced so far, but we're hopeful that uh, this will happen in the future. We hope so too. It's one of the, 
today is one of those extraordinary moments when all of us come here today, together today, you know, bound by common beliefs, but how can we even begin to, to stand in the shoes of someone like Nadia or someone like Wei Wei, who, who amongst us would want to spend their childhood growing up in a prison? And yet, look, you, you stand in front, you sit in front of us today with your shining spirit. How did that shape you, Wei Wei, as, as who you are today? Thank you. Um, it's a great question, and it's hard to explain, and uh, that only you know how to overcome it, right? But then I'll, I'll try to explain how it is. I think, um, I think it's fundamentally, it's um, knowing yourself what happened to you and realizing that that is injustice, that shouldn't happen again, to you or anybody else in, the, in your country or in the world. And also having like a good mentor. Uh, in my life especially, I realize I have a very, I have a privilege to have very uh, inspiring parents. And my father is the one who taught me humanity to be tolerant, to be um, forgiveful, and also to help others. So we were in the prison as family mem families, five of us, and uh, my fa because my father was a politician. Um, and yet I realized even in the prison, he was helping others, he was working, but even like risking her, his um, uh, prison time, if he caught up by the prison staff officers, he would uh, get more extra charge. And yet he was working. That made me feel, um, you know, more responsiveness. And you realize that however the life and your conditions is hard, at the end of the day, if you know what's going on to you, it is your responsibility to respond to it and to work on it. I think there should be another W in your name. WWW Wise Way Way. <laughs> and then you, once you got out of prison, you could have just had a life of abandon just to enjoy your life, but instead you set up two and then later a third NGO to work for justice and for rights in Myanmar. Many of you here will be following the progress of Myanmar. It's not easy for any country to emerge from a military dictatorship. Is it harder than you imagined? Um, yes, of course. Because when we were uh, released with the presidential amnesty, we were released as, uh, like, uh, by the president's statement saying that the political prisoners will be able to involve in the country's transformation, uh, I mean, democratic transformations. And we were very hopeful to get involved, to, to enjoy freedom, which we did not have for more than five decades. And um, we were, I actually thought we will have a lot of uh, freedom to, to around like freedom of expressions and and freedom to practice human rights and, and to have more dignified life than previous uh, under the um, dictatorship. Uh, but instead, what I have seen, I mean, at the beginning, I didn't realize for a few months, but later on, I was talking to, I was joining some political programs and I was talking to different minorities, like not people in Rangoon or in the capitals, in the cities, but people from rural areas, like ethnic areas. And I was specifically talking uh, to my uh, families, extended families in Rakhine State, and I realized their life was remained the same or even getting worse. And suddenly, like after a few months, we have seen the violence against the Rohingya and Muslim community which is portrayed as communal conflict. Of course, in our understanding today, it is not. So by then, since uh, then, 
the situation has deteriorated tremendously. And now it's like very like worrisome and um, very hor horrific stage of what's happening in Burma, not only just against the Rohingya community, but it's for the all ethnic minorities and freedom in itself, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association has been severely threatened recently, like uh, the journalist has been targeted and uh, it's been getting worse at the same times, like, you know, uh, the, the stage of like, like people life are not even secure. We've been hearing like increased numbers of people have been as an attack or to attack to that. So it's been increasing. So it's, it's really worrisome. I would say it's not as we expected. And this is the time to reflect and, and to move forward again. Secretary Clinton, you've heard so many stories over so many years, and yet we sit here, it's 2018, and we're still hearing Nadia's story, Weiwei's story. Do you sometimes worry that actually it's getting worse for women? No, I, I, I believe that certainly over the last 25 years, in many ways it has gotten better, but the work, as I said in my remarks, is unfinished. And then when we meet young women like Nadia and Weiwei, we understand even more uh, viscerally how that work has to remain at the forefront of our efforts. I think that the progress that has been made has been made in uh, laws being changed in uh, greater awareness in shining brighter lights, in journalists like yourself, Lise, who listen to these stories and uh, repeat them for the rest of the world. So I would say it's gotten better, but we're at a flexion point where I fear it could begin to deteriorate and become worse again. When you listen to um, Nadia's story, you realize the importance of law, the rule of law, due process, judicial systems, uh, international organizations that have to be sustained and supported to set standards and hold people accountable and serve as places of recourse for the Nadias of the world. And when you listen to Weiwei, you hear about her father. We need people in all walks of life to stand up and speak out, but also to demonstrate, to live tolerance and respect for human dignity and our common humanity. I think we're at this point where there's a premium on uh, top-down authority where there seems to be a uh, global turning away from international organizations, from the rule of law, and the United States is not playing the role that historically we have played, which is such a critical role. I've talked to scores and scores, maybe hundreds and hundreds of people by now who spent time in prison in the former Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain, in China, in other places, not just the current hotspots and conflicts. And almost to a person, they've said how important it was when the American president or the American secretary of state or the American first lady or the American anyone spoke out about the importance of uh, justice and treating people uh, with the kind of uh, care and um, appropriateness that was called for. If you don't have that echo in your ear, if you're not afraid of being called out and held up as uh, not caring or even being indifferent and rejecting these fundamental principles of human rights and the institutions that support them and being a real beacon for those who are under the 
the whip and the gun to look to, we begin to lose balance. And I am worried about that. So I see an upward trajectory, but I don't want us to plateau. I don't want us to grow tired or feel like it's none of our business anymore because we have to support not just individuals like Nadia and Weiwei and yourself because of the important role that journalists must play in speaking truth to power, but that we've got to do more to reestablish America's voice uh, in this arena. Well, anniversaries are often moments for everyone to reflect, so I, I must take this opportunity to ask, you mentioned in your, your speech, a hundred years, a century since British women won the right to vote. And yet some would say that women even in more developed Western societies are fighting the same issues. Equality, equal pay. What is your reflection on women and the power of politics as someone who's been through it all? Look, I, I think that you're, you're right to, to raise that because it's not just uh, the issues that we're talking about here in places like Iraq or Myanmar and so many others. Um, <clears throat> we have to protect and nurture the progress that's been made over the last hundred plus years. Uh, and I'm grateful that right now there's a very vigorous debate in our own country about a lot of these important matters about you know, women's autonomy and women's rights and, and the protection of, of women and the right to speak out and speak up on a range of uh, important uh, questions. But I also feel like there's a little bit of a pushback and a backlash going on here too. And I think it's important that we, just as we need to stand up and speak out for women and girls, um, elsewhere, we need to do the same here. Within the framework of democracy, the rule of law, and all that goes with it. Um, so we have our work cut out for us. Uh, we don't celebrate our 100th anniversary for two years. You were there before. Um, look, endemic misogyny and sexism is still a problem. It is not only blatant in many ways, it's also attitudinal and it suppresses a lot of uh, the opportunities and the potential of uh, women, particularly young women. Um, so our work isn't finished here either. It may not appear to be or even feel like it's as urgent, although I would argue that comparatively it is, um, as we hear about the problems facing the Rohingya and other ethnic uh, groups in uh, Myanmar or what happened to the Yazidis and others whose lives were totally uh, just uh, assaulted and in many cases destroyed by ISIS. But we should find common cause here. You know, fighting for human rights and women's rights and justice and equality um, should be one of the common endeavors that brings us together, uh, regardless of what society, country, ethnic, religious, tribal, nationalist group we may be part of. And again, I think the United States has a particular responsibility to uh, help to lead that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, some people have said to me that this is going to be the year of women. And if so, then it should be also the voices of the young women and men. And we've got some students who've sent us some questions. So I'm going to ask all of you some of the questions from the students. We have a question from Ali, who's from the class of 2019. Is Ali with us? There's Ali. Hello, Ali. <laughs> okay. uh, oh, Ali, Ali isn't a woman. Is that Ali? Yes. Great. Um, um, I'm going to put your question to, to Nadia. That what have you found to be the most effective ways of mobilizing people who are complacent, indifferent, in the face of adversity? وقف سه سالات شده که ما دیدی که دیم ال ایبادت که آل اگر که بس حمد که کشتن پنج هزاری ازدی و برنا هفت هزار که چو جنوزارو که و 
در کتنا چارصد هزار از دیل کم پاد و به مال چت دیم حکم کار بن تحدیا وی داعشی بکن و مکاری ام امون دان بن توحید ما که از دی که دیم امل تالی را مادکو لازم ام ببنه یا کم کار بن وی چت دیم پیر رابوین مبجی بینن. You know, we as a, as a community that have uh, gone through a, a genocide, a horrific act committed by ISIS in past three and a half years, and in addition to at least 5,000, over 5,000 people were killed, nearly 7,000 women and female children were abducted by this uh, group, and the entire community was displaced to refugee camps, and it has been more than three and a half years ever since. The, uh, the, the only thing and also that I've been telling people all the time is the synergy, uniting the efforts of, of all the members of the community against uh, the force of evil is what, what is challenging and what is uh, being very effective, and telling the terrorist organizations that we are united against you. Mm. Unity. I think it's something that we could all support you on. Thank you that, for that bit of advice. Now, Wei Wei, you told us about how you found that uh, spirit of tolerance when you were in the prison. Your mentors, including your father, helped you going. But we have a question from Celia from the School of Foreign Affairs 21. Where's Celia? Celia here? I think it's Celia. Maybe she had to go back to class. Um, hard, I would too if I was in the School of Foreign of Service. <laughs> How do you maintain enough hope and optimism to keep fighting for human rights? Um, yeah, I think, um, <laughs> how do you maintain hope? I mean, I forget to mention that I've been, I mean, I, while I was in the prison, I was reading, I was able to read some books after two years. For two years, we were not allowed to uh, even uh, get a book. And, um, and then I, I've got a chance to read some of the books. And I've been reading a lot of the struggles and biographies of people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, and many other leaders around the world. And I found um, resilience and strength and encouragement. And even today, I've been seeing um, a lot of the struggle that has been faced by many, many people around the world, including Yazidis and my own communities, and in different parts of the world and different causes, mainly when it's come to minorities. Life is not easy. When you are born to be a minority from a community of minority, and your life is not easy. And, and, at, and even then, I know that we have to survive. And we have to be able to bring equality, peace, and justice for those people. And that has been done in the past by our leaders. And I believe today, if we try, and one day in our next generations, we will, um, we will really bring justice for those uh, people. So I think my hope is just like, um, you know, being resilient and keep trying by hoping that one day we will achieve, and we did achieve in the past, the history of United States and, and all these histories uh, witness that we can achieve, and, and then it can only be achieved at the same time by uh, men power, people power. Men mean men and women. Men and women powers and solidarity, support, and education. So together, I think we can really bring the mission that we want to bring for the futures of our communities and human beings and people. Thank you, that's very good advice, especially for the students here. <laughs> Hashtag keep trying. And your comments where we lead us right to this, to this next question. And in my, in my work, I often say the questions can be more interesting than the answers. I'm sure the answer will be interesting, but the question is very interesting. Is Siddharth here, who put this question that I'm going to, where's Siddharth? There you go, Siddharth, great question. And he spelt it out. This is a question for Secretary Clinton, so I will ask her. Uh, School of Foreign Service 2021. 
What role can and should men play in the advancement of women in issues of peace and security? Oh, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> um, as big a role as you possibly can, I think is the short answer. Uh, and there are so many ways to uh, participate and to support uh, this uh, unfinished business getting finally finished. Uh, you, you heard from Weiwei the influence of her own father. I mean, do not discount the importance of personal uh, support and interest, uh, encouragement, action. Uh, that sounds simplistic, but it's probably the most profound thing you can do uh, in helping uh, women and girls be given the support, the uh, kind of tools that uh, they need, the confidence that is often necessary, the resilience, which is uh, essential. And also, if you're interested in these issues beyond the personal, uh, there are so many ways to serve. There are all kinds of NGOs and nonprofits and government organizations. Uh, you heard Nadia mention the UN, uh, the important work of trying to bring ISIS and the leaders of ISIS to justice uh, is work that never ends and needs willing hands, especially uh, people with the education you're receiving at the Foreign Service School. I think also politically. Uh, voting for people who care about these issues and taking a hard look at your own really personal views. I mean, I think everyone has to purge themselves of prejudicial thoughts, of uh, worries about who's uh, on top and who isn't uh, in the world as it is today. You heard uh, Weiwei say, you know, being born into a minority is hard. It's hard everywhere. Um, and if you find yourself in a role where you can speak out and speak up uh, and not go along with either remaining silent or even chiming in about derogatory remarks about women and girls, um, and also minorities, but to focus on women and girls, you know, be that person, be that man uh, who you know, doesn't let it go on, who stands up or speaks out, uh, and use your voting power as a citizen uh, in a democracy uh, to also register your uh, feelings about these issues. Uh, so there's a lot to be done, and if you go into business, you know, make sure that women are paid equally and treated uh, equally. I have a, a good friend who runs a huge tech company. And he runs this huge tech company. He's a wonderful guy. He's got two great daughters. And he kept hearing about how there was not equal pay for equal work. And he thought to himself, well, that can't possibly be true you know, in my company. And he actually launched a total analysis of comparing years of service, levels of education, across his entire company, thousands of employees. And guess what he found out it was? Absolutely true in his own company. And he was embarrassed and really surprised. And it wasn't that people were sitting around saying, well, okay, we have you know, two college graduates, they start off at the same, but you know, over the next four or five years, you know, the young man's gonna go better and he's gonna do more and we're gonna reward him. Or we've got two PhD computer scientists and after the same number of years, we're gonna give the guy more chances. It, it wasn't that explicit. It was much more, you know, just almost implied uh, bias about women and women's roles and women's uh, uh, success. So there's just so many ways to be an ally and a friend uh, and supporter of uh, these causes here in this country and uh, around the world. Thank you. Did you get that, Siddharth? If you forget anything, it's this is all recorded. So you just ask for a recording from Georgetown and you just study it and give it to all your friends. Now, I don't, just, I don't, we don't want the energy to go one way, but I want to just get a sense of who you are out there at this, this moment. It's an 
important moment, both for men and women, it's an important moment for our world. How many of you came here today on this lovely sunny morning in, in Washington, how many of you came here today with a sense of, of hope, more hope than, than anxiety and fear? How many of you came more with hope than anxiety and fear? Hmm. And how many of you wake up in the morning with a dread and, and a fear that this moment is actually a, a moment that is fraught with risk? Hmm. Hmm. And how many are you going to go home more hopeful after today's session? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, this is a good question for both you, Nadia, and, and Weiwei. This is your moment. You've got some of the best and the brightest students here, and sort of the la creme in Washington. And this question from Agnieszka. Um, Agnieszka, are you here? You're from the School of Foreign Service 2021. Where are you? There you are. Great. Very practical do, a doer. What can college-age women do now to promote peace across the globe from the United States. So sitting in the United States, what can they possibly do to help peace? Wait, wait, can they, are those, yeah, answer, yeah. Because the world's not, it's not so, the world is a lot closer these days. Yeah, so thank you for the practical questions. I think um, uh, young people, I mean, everybody can do things. To, if they care. The only thing is we need to care and we need to learn and we need to understand and respond. As young people, I think today's young people has better chance than any other age because techno the advancements of technology is our advantage. And we have to use that technology um, in an effective way. Uh, basically, you know, social media, and um, the, the, you know, the, the, all this digital platform is our advantage. So I would encourage everybody to learn beyond your community, your country, and throughout the world, and what's happening in the, all the corners of the world, and really respond whatever you can, at least by using technology. But then there are many other ways that you can uh, respond to, for example, mobilizing around your community and in your country, in your college, doing events and discussing among each other and how we can really best respond. In my experience, one of the way to take actions and to respond is by actually seeking for advice and consulting with different people, and you never make mistake if you console with others. Um, among ourselves as young people, we can uh, discuss and come up with the great, great ideas you may have even better than my or Nadia or all other activists. So I would, my, I would say like that. Thank you. <laughs> مساعدائك بيكرن كتعليم ديم البيش همو تشتي بيش برداعش قوات أخوة همو كراسر هزار زاروكا كتعليم شوان تعليم بده بروان وان بكا أرهاب وعالمي برو خرابية بده دانا برو تطورية وشيتري بكا وتشتي ديتر كمروف كالأمريكا بيو كالعراق بيو كال الكي جهيبه ثقافته يكون دو بخون دو زان بيو ملاد يكون دو ناز بكن كشتنا يكون دو ناكن كيكون دو تقبل بكن بهتر. I think for uh, one very important point about uh, peace is uh, to teach the children and to educate the children and to you know implant different things and be more positive about the li about the life and how the peace is implemented for example isis was training and brainwashing hundreds and thousands of children including yazidi children who were abducted and to indoctrinate them and brainwash them and teach them how to kill so i think we can reverse that by teaching them how to love one another and spread uh, this education and, and make sure that this is a top priority piece. And for those people who live in the United States and other parts of the world, I think uh, learning about 
other people's culture is very important because ISIS uh, didn't want to learn about Yazidi culture and other cultures in minorities. So I think cultural relativism is a very important thing, which means you know you accept the other culture's way of life and so they can respect you and your culture. And in this case, there will be a peaceful coexistence. Yes, thank you. Very good job. The questions are getting tougher, I have to say, as we go on. Where is Sig I think it's Signe? What a beautiful name. Signe, Signe, Signe. Did I pronounce it correctly? Signe. Signe. Now, Signe's question is so complicated, I, I need to have a policy nerd to ask it. Now, I want, do I have any policy nerds on my panel? <laughs> Secretary Clinton. Hmm. Secretary Clinton. And I this thought you looking at Milan. <laughs> <laughs> this is one I know you know the answer to. Climate change is anticipated to exacerbate conflict over scarce resources and worsen the risk of certain natural disasters. Women are disproportionately vulnerable to these risks. So Singye asked, how can women, especially students here, I like this that you're bringing your questions back to you, um, help other women across the world face these risks? It's oh, a great question. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I, you know, I do, I, I want to answer it in three parts. I do think that there needs to be more political pressure put on the current administration to get back into the Paris Agreement. Mm. And the fact that we are the only country, <laughs> we're the only country left in the world. Syria actually was the other holdout. They've joined the Paris Agreement. And I think that there has been, there's been so many issues that people are concerned about that it's easy to get spread so thin that we don't make a uh, significant impact on the political calculations uh, and thinking of the administration and Congress. So I would hope that there could be much more activity around climate change with a specific goal. And my, you know, my suggestion, although there could very well be others, is put the United States back into the Paris Agreement. And lots of you know, lots of student activity, lots of, you know, old fashioned stuff like phone calling and everything, but also a, a consistent presence uh, trying to make that case. Because that will enable us to try to do more as a country, uh, even though it's going to be difficult, I admit, to try to change this policy. But I recently met with the UN official responsible for implementing uh, the Paris Agreement, and she's optimistic about the work that's being done between other governments and not-for-profits and private businesses in our country. A lot of mayors and governors are stepping up. So in addition to trying to put pressure coming from campuses and elsewhere about getting the United States back into the Paris Agreement, there's much that can be done here at home that will be beneficial globally. Uh, so looking for ways to work with not-for-profits, even private sector uh, businesses, and certainly uh, governments, uh, volunteering, doing whatever you can to help us uh, organize ourselves here on the local and state level, uh, waiting until we get back into a, a national commitment. With respect to the rest of the world, I would say that particularly uh, for women, you're absolutely right. They will bear the brunt of looking for the food, looking for the firewood, uh, looking for uh, the place to migrate to when all of the grass is finally gone as the uh, desertification moves south and you have to keep moving your livestock or your crops are no longer uh, growing, they're burning up in uh, the intense heat that we're now seeing reported uh, across uh, North Africa into the Middle East and into India. So yes, women once again will be the primary, uh, primarily burdened with the uh, problems of climate change. So look for international organizations to support. Uh, there are some groups that are planting trees and people say, well, you know, that's kind of, you know, a simple thing. I want to do something really important. Planting trees is really important. Um, and helping to move toward uh, more uh, drought-resistant uh, kinds of trees and shrubbery just to try to save the soil, try to create some shade, try to 
give something uh, to eat, agitating for uh, drought resistant seeds and, uh, and seedlings that can be uh, planted and nurtured. Because remember, 60% of the smallholder farmers in the world are women. I'm talking about less than an acre in most instances. So they're out there toiling to grow enough food to feed their own family and maybe have a little extra to go to market. Get involved with the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, something that we helped to kick off when I was Secretary of State, because changing the way that women and girls cook is good for the environment. It's also good for their health, because the fourth leading cause of death in the world is respiratory illnesses largely driven by uh, cooking uh, in closed uh, spaces using uh, fuels that uh, affect your lungs. So there are lots of ways from, you know, our own uh, challenges here at home all the way to supporting uh, programs and projects that are taking place around the world uh, that can make a difference in uh, women's lives. Uh, there is some progress, not nearly enough, and without the United States government, the national government being a leader, I think our efforts are going to be certainly hobbled by uh, our lack of uh, involvement, but we can't let that stop us from doing everything we possibly can to try to make a difference on climate change here in the United States and around the world, knowing full well that it will have a, and is having already, uh, a very negative impact uh, in many places and the burden disproportionately falling on women and children. Thank you, thank you very much. One last question from the students. Where is Chris from? He's going to graduate in 2021. Is Chris here? Maybe he had to go back to class. Where's Chris? Chris, you're going to get all of us in trouble. There's no way, man, we can answer this question. Who is a woman in global politics who inspires you? Now, I spoke to Weiwei about it, and she said, oh, if I don't name, if I name this one and don't name this one, all of us here know so many women in global politics who inspire us. So I'm gonna ask all of us to answer this question by clapping now for all of the women in global politics who inspire us. <laughs> Chris, you and Siddharth are going to get together and you're going to go over those lessons under that tree that you plant. And you're going to come up with all of those, those, women, those women's issues you're going to understand. We've come to the end of our discussion. Secretary Clinton, if you could leave us with one last word. You talked about a backlash. How do you see this backlash against women's rights and what can be done about it? Uh, I see it as a... Um a reaction that is you know, driven by uh, lots of different motives, some of them having to do with people feeling insecure, frightened, uh, disappointed, discouraged, name whatever uh, emotion you want, about their lives and the ongoing uh, globalization of the economy, uh, which is leaving many people out, and we haven't seen anything yet, because wait till robotics and AI, artificial intelligence, really take off. And so when people are insecure and anxious, they often uh, defend against their own feelings by uh, rejecting uh, others. And that often happens with minorities, it happens with ethnic ethnicities, races, religions, and it also happens with respect to women. Um, so any of you who've read my, uh, my book about what happened know that I think that uh, misogyny and sexism was part of that campaign. Uh, it was one of the contributing factors and some of it was uh, old fashioned sexism uh, and a refusal to accept the equality of women and certainly the equality of women's leadership and some of it as an uh, outgrowth of uh, all this anxiety and insecurity that is playing on people and leading them uh, in a hunt for scapegoats. So we've got to deal with that here at home and I think that comes through the ballot box. This is an election year, uh, 2018 in the United States, so there's a lot that can be done to say, wait a minute, uh, we're not going backwards when it comes to race and religion 
uh, and sex and gay rights and all the rest of it. We're going to keep forward moving because we want an inclusive, tolerant society. And that includes everybody, not just some of us, but all of us. Uh, so certainly voting remains the principal way that every individual can express an opinion and anyone who chooses not to vote basically cedes that opinion uh, to others who perhaps don't hold your values. And then speaking up and speaking out against the backlash or against the atrocities being committed uh, against women and girls elsewhere is critically important as well. Uh, and we've talked about some of the ways of doing that. But remaining vigilant, remaining uh, a, uh, a very committed uh, advocate on behalf of women and girls here at home and around the world, uh, and helping others to understand why you feel that way and why it's important, why you took time out to come uh, to this event for the Institute, uh, all has positive incremental effects. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I end up being very confident and optimistic because we are not going back and women's voices are not shutting up. <laughs> Secretary Clinton, thank you. Weiwei, Nadia, thank you. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.